Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. We've arrived at our next installment in our Make Disciples podcast series, where we are covering what a disciple is, who we are in Christ, and what are the characteristics of a follower of our team. Today we are discussing the characteristic the disciples of Godly. As usual, we have Michael, our resident ephesiologist. I'm Andrew Johnson, associate pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas. And uh, it seems that we love everyone from Australia. And so we just keep trying to find more and more wise people. And the Lord is blessing us. Today, we have Bev Murrell. And she is joining us from Australia. Bev is the founder of the Kyria Network, who works with Christian women leaders and professionals operating in England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Australia. She is also the founder of Cherish Uganda, providing homes and education for abandoned children who are HIV positive. Um, And also, Bev has done a ton of work in the world of church planting And she is unique in, well, I shouldn't say unique, but Bev, your heart is split between Australia and the UK as your children and grandchildren are thrown between all of these lands. So Bev, (laughs) welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast. Wow. It's great to be here. Thanks for the really cool introduction. Hey, you are really cool. So that's why it's a little easier. For sure. Well, we're we're so excited, Bev, that you're joining us and grateful for the work that you've been doing. At some point, we need to talk more about Uganda. You, you know, I was just in East Africa, and I uh, would love to hear more about the work there. But uh, we're grateful for uh, you coming on and talking about this th- topic of disciples are godly. And I know you have a, a particular angle that you're going to take here as we get into this conversation. Why does it matter to you, Bev? Why does it matter that disciples are godly? It matters to me because I've observed that disciples will take the lead from the people who are discipling them. And so therefore, if the disciples are godly, are determined to live for Christ, then they're going to impart that to the people who Mm -hmm. they're discipling. But it's you will impart whatever you are to the people that you're discipling. So therefore, if you're um, avaricious or if you crave celebrity or if you are bullying, you're going to impart that to the people that you're discipling and then they will impart that on as well. So it's absolutely vital for the godliness of the discipler to be in it for the sake of the living, vibrant, organic Church of Jesus Christ, which is meant to go from generation to generation with a heart to build the kingdom and not to build an empire for whomever the disciple happens to be. And I feel like we've seen so much evidence in these last years, probably over all the centuries, but, you know, I've only been alive. I'm a baby boomer. So Mm. as long as I've been alive, you just keep seeing leaders and people who have discipled others, not in the way of Christ, but still with a Christian um, headline and yet going in really directions that Jesus would never go in. And so it's really important for me to watch disciples and the people that they disciple to, to see that they're working for the good of the kingdom, that they're working in, in humility and grace and wisdom, and a desire that this person that they're discipling will develop to be able to follow Christ and not specifically follow us. Because truthfully, discipleship isn't for the sake of the learner. It's for the sake of the future of the kingdom Mm. of God. Wow, that is a great perspective. For the sake of the future. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry for the awkward podcast silence as Michael and I are both stunned by such a a solid line. Bev, what do you think? um, Okay. I want to get back to that exact topic. First question. um, I think you've talked around it. Could you define what it means to be godly? I mean, if we're going to say that it's really important that disciples are godly, 
what is that? What are we trying to guide people for towards? And then as I know, you'll knock that one out of the park. What does it mean to you to be focused on discipling for the future? Okay. So I became a Christian as an adult and I really wanted to be godly. So there was that. But in hindsight, I can say that godliness, as it was modeled to me, had a lot to do with legalism and following Mm. the rules and making sure you did this and that and you just pray at this certain time and read this amount of your Bible. But if the undercurrent is that you're bullying people around you or uh, you you're not always honest and and if that's waved away because well we're just human that what we end up with is people mistaking godliness for for legalism and sweeping under the carpet a whole lot of things that Jesus really did do and i think we're watching this consistently pol- politically now that Jesus was the lover of our souls he was the he was always willing to speak directly to people about the issues that were plaguing them but he didn't accuse and he didn't blame in fact he only accused the religious elite he didn't accuse the sinners who came to him he just came alongside and began to work with them and in actual fact um in the 4th century in britain in the celtic church there was a theologian named pelagius and pelagius um developed this concept uh, yeah of <laughs> anamkara and anamkara literally means soul friend a friend mm. of your soul so a soul friend was a person who traveled the road before you and they could see what was up ahead they could see the pitfalls they could see where you could take refuge and what would be a dangerous place to go and how to take shelter and all the rest of it and that soul friend would walk with you as a christian um not they'd walk with you with humility And they'd walk with you with grace and they weren't superior and they weren't trying to make you one of their minions, but they were honestly looking to see who you are in Christ and what your possibilities were and what your potential was. So they weren't, it wasn't an asking and giving permission kind of relationship, but on the contrary, it was, I will walk with you. And as we walk together, I will do my best to show you Mm. how to live this Christ life. It's a narrow road, but the narrowness isn't defined by legalistic ways of showing other people that you've ticked all the boxes. The reality of it is is how to live for Christ in a way that shows his love for the world so that people can, all men can be drawn unto him because it says in um it says in John three seventeen, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, yeah. but that through him everybody would be saved. And, of course, mm. everybody isn't saved, but it seems to me that we, we redefine godliness as, as I'm ticking all the boxes. And yeah. that's a really, really dangerous thing for the church. Yeah. In fact, just recently I was preaching and something struck me. We have retranslated Emmanuel, God with us, to be God is on our side. Hmm. And um, that that's not the case. That, that's not the case that God with us means I'm right and you're wrong. Um, hmm. God with us means there's a place where we can stand together and I don't have to agree with you, but... I, but the place we stand is holy ground and you are created in the image of God and so am I. And so despite our lack of agreement, I can still treat you as somebody who is an image bearer. Mm. Oh, I it, love that. I love that. But if, okay, so I got super excited when you mentioned Pelagius. Uh, he is, and I'm gonna. this is going to have to take some explanation here because he, uh, as we know, historically has been branded a heretic. Uh, but Pelagius is one of my heroes, uh, to be perfectly honest. And so I have to explain it, though. Um, we know. Can, wait, can the- we, uh, are you also announcing your next book, uh, Pelagius, <laughs> Hero or Heretic? So there we go. Uh, coming out from Michael Cooper, late 2024. Continue, Michael. Yeah, yeah. I did write an article about Pelagius uh, some years ago. 
um, uh, I, I don't remember where it was published in a journal somewhere, I think. But anyway, so uh, Pelagius, like you said, in the fourth century from from uh, Britain, comes to Rome. And when he is in Rome, he sees the moral laxity that's happening in the city of Rome. And he is just distressed about this. And so he calls people to godliness. He calls them to live as if, uh, you know, to live Christ-like. And uh, the unfortunate consequence of that is that he was viewed as uh, promoting a works salvation, that you had to earn your salvation. But that wasn't Pelagius at all. He wrote a beautiful commentary on the book of Romans, and he so clearly articulates in, in that commentary that, uh, that we are sinners and that we are in need of God's grace. So he was, he was as orthodox as anyone in the fourth century. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Augustine, when he first learned about Pelagius, was excited to meet him uh, and to interact with him. In fact, he had a very favorable perspective of who Pelagius was at the beginning. And the unfortunate thing is that Pelagius and Augustine never met, even though they were in close proximity to each other. They never actually met face to face. But as we know, Augustine wrote a number of, of uh, letters, uh, polemics, if you will, against Pelagius and what he believed uh, he was espousing as a work salvation. But uh, ultimately, Pelagius was, was uh, put on trial, and uh, he was acquitted of any heretical uh, teaching. Uh, but interestingly enough, his disciple, Celestius, is the one who propagated a work salvation. He completely misunderstood Pelagius, and, uh, and consequently, at the Council of Ephesus in 431, it's Celestius who is condemned as a heretic, not Pelagius. Wow. And so we, we, we've mixed that up. And it's so unfortunate that Pelagianism has, you know, his name attached to it and it's associated with a heresy of, of work salvation. But um, in, in fact, Pelagius himself was not a heretic, but just a, a lover of God who was passionate about uh, calling Christians to walk in a Christ-like way. And, uh, and he did not see a separation between the way in which we believe and the way in which we behave. They had to go together. And your mm. behavior was a demonstration of what it was you believed. And that, that's what was so distressing to him of, when he saw that moral laxity in the city of Rome. But thank mm. you for bringing him up. I love the idea of a soul friend. Um, it is so important to have someone to walk along with in, in, in discipleship. I mean, we're all disciples, right? And just mm -hmm. because some of us might be in a leadership position, that doesn't mean that we've achieved some, mm -mm. you know, uh, uh, platform of being a discipler. We, mm -hmm. we all continue to be discipled mm -hmm. and, or, or, if we're not, we should be continuing mm. to be discipled by those sort of soul friends. You know, yeah. they could be someone that is a peer to us. It could be yeah. a historical figure. Uh, it, yeah, there are just a number of people that can still build into our lives as disciples. Yeah. yeah, and I do think that even though people are in leadership, there are always other wise figures around them. And if we're not playing games of one-upmanship, if we're able to come with humility to our friends mm. and say, you know what, I'm really feeling stuck here, that would save a lot of the desperately tragic falls that we've seen from so many of our famous leaders and less famous leaders if people just felt able to go go to their friends, even if you don't have somebody who's gone the road before you, if you've got somebody who's working, who's walking alongside you, somebody who's it got a similar level of maturity and all that, then that would make so much difference because mm. discipleship is, um, discipleship is, it should never stop. 
It should never stop. It should be that mm. we inform each other, that we help each other, that we support each other. And, and when I began, I wasn't wanting to put across the idea that godliness is if you do this and then you do that. I think it's the very opposite. For me, godliness is the humility to listen to others, to be able to change your mind, to seek out what God is saying, not to read your Bible so that you know you've picked that box, but to read in order for it to read you, and then to be Mm. able to impart that to other people so that you're not saying to them, if you do this and you do that and you do that, then it's like the missionaries going to native lands and if the mis- if the people put their clothes on they were considered to have become christian you know mm-hmm. it's it's not that yeah well you know what you are throwing out so many great nuggets we read the bible so it could read us mm-hmm. i i love that how does that that aspect of um scripture almost being a well see it's weird to say a two way street but where we are actually not coming just to say, I want to glean, I want to, I want to learn. I want to fill my head with knowledge. I want to get smarter. So I'm just going to study all this. And at the end of it, I'm going to be called smart. Um, how, how do we get to a place where we are able to come to scripture with an open and humble heart as disciples? I think it still is to do with our own internal understanding. For me, when I begin, I love reading my Bible anyway. I love my mm-hmm. Bible. Um, I have a lot. It's a lot easier for me to read my Bible than to have a great prayer life. You know, I'm constantly working on the prayer life um, part of it. But to come, but what began to make a massive difference was as I just began to sit before the Lord with my Bible open and commit to Him, I want to hear from you today, Lord. And then not be trying to race through a certain amount of scripture, but when I did hear from Him, which I always did, to be able to write that down and begin to think through and pray through, Lord, how will that affect me? And there's a lot of times when I read my Bible and, um, just put a question mark year after year uh, on the same because I couldn't understand it. Uh, and then and then all of a sudden one day there's just a breakthrough and I think, oh, okay, I mm. get that. You know, um, mm-hmm. one of those times was was talking about the mirrors that um, the, the women gave their mirrors for the brazen altar. And I was just like, why does that matter? And then it took me about 14 times, 14 years, and then suddenly thinking, oh, it was because they had to stop looking, they had to stop judging themselves based on how they looked in 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 the way other people saw them, and they had to look into the clear water in the brazen laver and see what God was saying about them. Well, mm. that was massive for me. That was massive. It was just such a big thing because it changed it gave me a greater understanding that it doesn't matter what other people think of me. It just matters how I am with the Lord and how he sees mm. me and how he wants me to change. I don't know mm. whether that's a bit of a red herring, but anyway. Mm. Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a red herring. No, not at all. Uh, there's, there's an aspect of this as we're talking. Um, I find myself um, interacting with, uh, the idea that godliness, it's its literally built into the word, right? This is a God-focused, I want to reflect him. Um, I want to look like him. I want what comes out of my life to be like him. However, if you describe things just right, it can almost make it sound like you can achieve this without God, right? Uh, I just need to realize that people love me. I need to see myself as lovable. I need to see myself as humble and not better than anybody else. Um, how are you going to, how would you describe Bev what you're talking about to be different than just high self-esteem or hanging out with people who just like being with you? I, I think that you've hit the nail on the head. For me, it's about humility. So the Christianity that I was enculturized in, bearing in mind that I was in my 20s and married when I became a Christian, was in terms of how you looked and what you did and who you were seen to be with and all of those things. And to gradually unravel that and untangle that has taken a lot of years. And Mm -hmm. in many ways, 
Um, it was living in England for 17 years and the British are a lot more humble uh, than mm. either the Australians or the Americans. And so the Lord was able to, even though we went there to lead a church, the Lord was able to really change my understanding of what success in his eyes, godliness in his eyes looked like. It wasn't in appearance. It actually is in the heart. So mm. my whole understanding of the need for humility has revolutionized my understanding of discipleship to just we're just one of a group of everybody else and we're some of us have gone further down the road than others but it's in our transparency i think that's really the word transparency we we talk about accountability but the truth is we can be accountable only to the degree that we choose and we can hide the rest but mm -hmm. to make a decision to live a transparent life among the others that you work with, even if you're leading them, that means that there's room to be able to say, uh, yeah, actually my prayer life is the thing that I have to keep working on because that's what I need to keep working on. Mm -hmm. With that, Rather than give an impression that it, the problem with preachers actually and leaders is that they can give the impression that everything's fine in their lives. I mean, actual fact, it can be complete chaos. There's a really good book out by a British guy called Simon P. Walker, and um, he, he lectures in one of the colleges, but it's called The Undefended Leader. And one of the things that he introduces, the whole premise that he's writing about, is the fact that we have a front stage and a backstage, and that one of them will suffer for the, for the other one unless we are able to bring them both to God and find out how to live equally on the stage or off as the same person. And I feel mm. like that's mm. what godliness is. And sometimes people make mistakes and they, you know, they end up doing something really wrong. Well, then to be able to come back and say, you know what, I did this but I, I need help to be restored is actually, that's the thing, that's godliness, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that's godliness, to be able to acknowledge acknowledge what you don't have and what you haven't done. And if if a leader can do that or a discipler can do that, he doesn't have to go to the people he's discipling necessarily, but he does have to go to somebody and talk through and get help. It's about being transparent and it's about having humility and it's about knowing what you both have said only through Jesus Christ, you know, uh, Jesus Christ the righteous. And there's no other way. There's no other way. And I have learned that in the years after I was enculturized into thinking I just had to present well. Mm, wow. It really, it, it is an interior thing, isn't it? Not an external thing. Uh, mm. Mm. I love that, it, Bev. It seems that uh, for a whole lot of what I, I have seen in my younger years, that we have just spent so much time talking discipleship in terms of external or exterior, um, how it comes across. And even so, I... I I am one of those preacher types, Bev, and um, I have long gotten the feedback, thankfully, not as much lately, um, but that the uh, the onstage Andrew was not even close to the offstage Andrew. Now, it wasn't saying that I presented a perfect Im image and my life was going to hell in a handbasket offstage. It was more of that personal aspect. Like I felt like I had to put on a voice or put on an image or put on, um, this is what a, a good preacher sounds like. And this is, this is how they talk. And so long people were saying, um, yeah, your content was fine. You just sounded horrible because you sounded nothing like yourself. And mm -hmm. so again and again, the feedback was be who you are. Don't try to be somebody mm. else. Be this mm. authentic, true, committed Jesus follower who definitely doesn't have it all figured out and bring that. Bring that as somebody who is bringing God's word, as somebody who is also in process, somebody who is also still at work on the interior. I find it fascinating that we know that humility, I mean, if we've ever read Philippians, 
chapter two at some point, we, we should have realized that humility is kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, we, we have our we have our answers of what we need to be focused on. And yet we all say, well, thanks for that advice. So what's next? Yeah. And yet this base level humility is actually one of the linchpins. We must have yeah. it to yes. have godliness as God is calling us to. Yeah. When you think about, for example, about um, Elisha and Elijah, Elisha really wanted what, you know, what was there, what was there for him to receive from Elijah, even mm-hmm. though Elijah wasn't perfect. But then Elisha starts to mentor Gehazi and Gehazi's got a completely different agenda, mm-hmm. although mm-hmm. you would think it's the same agenda. He just wants to learn from the prophet, but he didn't. He had mm-hmm. a different agenda. And and I think to myself sometimes, did Elisha know that when he first said yes to Gehazi? And maybe he did, but that's because none of us are perfect. And so probably he was hoping that Gehazi would would begin to understand, you know, what godliness actually was, but he never did. And so that's, you know, that therein lies the rub. My goodness. Uh, Bev, we mentioned that you are a part of the Kyria Network. You are the founder, co-founder of the Kyria Network. What in what way have you seen this important focus on discipleship show its face well in the Kyria Network? Well, Kyria Network is for women leaders. And so Christian women leaders, they could be, um, you know, they they can be pastors, they can be ministry leaders, but they could also be educators or medical people or whatever. And the idea was that in many contexts, uh, women are not necessarily free to minister in the way that God has called them to do. And so the Kyria Network provides a place to champion those women, to empower them, to help them be released in ministry. And so within that context now, as the as the ministry has grown significantly, there are now mentoring opportunities. And we also run something called Collab, C-O-L-L-A-B, which is specifically we have 12 Um, emerging leaders, women who are in their late teens and their early 20s, and they are going through a program through over a 12-month period with uh, senior women that are talking to them about preaching or, um, you know, uh, leading in various aspects. So there's a lot of hands-on mentoring, uh, but there's also wider, there's conferences and there's retreats and et cetera. So it's really to provide an avenue to give people room to know that if God is calling them, we're going to support that call and do all mm-hmm. we can to help you be able to go forward in that. What mm-hmm. a neat ministry. Hmm. I love that. If, if any of our listeners um, are excited uh, by that, prospect how would they get more information about the collabs or other things that the curia network is doing well i i don't think the question is if i think it is when they're excited about what <laughs> what you're talking about bev oh uh, great well um the website is www.curianetwork.com so curia is spelled k y r i a and Kyria comes from the word in 2 John 1, where John's writing to the chosen lady, Kyria Electa. Hmm. And um, the idea there, the word Kyria, and, and we know Kyrios is, means Lord. Jesus was called Kyrios. But it's a word that means govern, governor or leader in the context of Lord and Lady. So the fact that she wasn't called, and I'm not going to pronounce the Latin words properly, but she's not called Gyne, chosen woman. She's called Curia, which is chosen governor who happens to be female, chosen leader. And so uh, that was why I named that. I've always had, um, I, when I became a Christian, it was clear that I had a call to preach, but I um, The context that I was in made it very clear that I couldn't be. And so um, gradually as the Lord began to change that context and I began to move out into the more public arena, I realised it's helpful 
for other women to have people who've gone the road before them, like the Soul Friends. And I think Kyria, the Kyria Network is mm-hmm. endeavouring to be Soul Friends to those who are trying to find their way forward in that ministry. So I used to run something called Leading Ladies, which was a retreat in England for a number of years. And when I stopped doing it, it was very successful, but in the end I felt to stop doing it. And then um, somebody came to me and said, Bev, you have to you have to keep going. And so Kyria Network came out of that. And when I left England, um, uh, uh, somebody that I actually mentored for about 15 years, Amy um, Summerfield, became the CEO of that. And under Amy's really, really strong and gifted leadership, has come not just Kyria England but Kyria Scotland, hmm. Kyria Wales, and now Kyria Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland is a very, very tough place for women to be ministers in. And, of course, because I've moved back to Australia, Kyria Australia has begun as well. So we're seeing it proliferate just because there's a need but also because it's not a hierarchical kind of organization we're just trying to be in it together people who love the lord who have a calling on our lives and we want to support each other and as we've said before discipling and mentoring each other even as peers not just in a senior junior kind of relationship but as peers we support each other so Mm. we've got some of the most strategic um people on our board, including, um, you may know him, Stephen Holmes, who is a professor at St. Andrews, and a number of other really, really great people who are totally uh, advocating for women to lead. Yeah. Wow. What what a neat ministry. It sounds like it. Um, Bev Merle, thank you so, so very much for being with us today. Now, uh, like Michael said, not if people were excited by what you said. Since people were excited by what you said, where can they follow up with what more you are doing or are a part of after they listen to this podcast? So www.kyrianetwork.com and Kyria is K-Y-R-I-A. That is... And, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from people. We hope so. We hope we, they inundate you. So... Uh, <laughs> Bev, truly, 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 thank you so much for being with us. And we also want to thank you, our listener, for joining us too in this Make Disciples podcast series. If this was your first podcast in the series, or if you're interested in finding more of our Ephesiology podcast catalog, visit us online at ephesiology.com or simply scroll back on our podcast feed and click on any of the topics that interest you. Now, lastly, Please check out all the resources that we have for you at masterclasses.ephesiology.com. I'm certain it is going to be a blessing to you. So from Michael, Bev, and myself, thanks for doing Theology in Community with us today on the Ephesiology Podcast.